Uh, for those of you who I may not have met, I'm Gary Green, I'm president for Site Technical Community College here in, in Winston-Salem. Uh, our panelists include uh, Dr. Stan Hill, who is the director of CERL here, and I know uh, those of you who are uh, with us earlier today heard Stan uh, and, and launch his comments. Uh, we're also honored to have, as, as a guest in our community, Dr. Bruce Novak from the University of Texas in Dallas. Dr. Novak, thank you for thank you for coming, and thank you for being a part of a special day for us uh, in, uh, in education. Dr. Raymond Bouchard from the uh, uh, Wake Forest University's uh, Physician Assistant uh, School, which is here in the Innovation Quarter. And then uh, Eric uh, Grant from the PA School is also with us today. Thank you for being here also. I'm going to start the panel by, uh, by asking each of our panelists to, to make a comment and, and to get our discussion going about this link between STEM learning, K-12, post-secondary education, and then into the job career education. Stan, I want you to start with this one. Way back in the 90s, the five time I had a little set of grammar. We were like the Houston News Force for the Oregon Suspendents, and we were brought a superintendent. And he said that he grew up poor in the South, and he said uh, there were halves and half bottles. Halves were people who had money, and half bottles were those who didn't. And this is like in the 90s, it's a flaw back, but his point was. In the future, he predicted we are still going to have the halves and the half dollars. And the halves are going to be the children who have access to science, technology, engineering, and technology. That set of skills and half dollars are going to be those who don't. And I don't even think we had the acronym STEM at that time. But my, my issue is who's in the pipeline? And how can we diversify the people in the pipeline? And how can we make sure that the kids who get in there stay in? and are supported because I think that it's not a function of their capacity to perform, it's a function of our willingness to get them in there and support them uh, so that they can enter this workforce as well. So although I'm at medical school, I spent 28 years of my career in the K-12 arena, and so that's that's where I think we have the challenge in that area. I'm, uh, Bruce Novak, Dean of uh, Natural Sciences and Mathematics in UT Dallas. I've also spent uh, a few years here at Fort Bragg, early 70s, and 13 years at NC State as the uh, Department Head of Chemistry. So I'm familiar with the state, and terrific that you have me back at this point. Uh, in, my, in my school, so Natural Sciences and Mathematics, in my school is the uh, is the science and math uh, education department. Uh, we don't have an education department on our campus. And uh, and Joe Ferrar, Dr. Joe Ferrar here, who we met earlier today, is uh, was under my uh, my uh, office. This I'm here today. I can't speak to the job. Uh, as, to, as to what uh, the post-secondary uh, opportunities are. But I can speak very clearly to the students that are coming into the university for the first, for, for the first time, first time freshmen. And we have, we have very big problems. Students come in with extraordinarily high SAT scores but they're not problem solvers. They don't know how to critically maneuver through complex problems. They don't know how to communicate either in the written form or verbally. And this causes tremendous angst for everybody involved. And so if we can make a contribution through these educational programs now we we're in existence sixth grade, eighth grade, these are the, this is the intervention time uh, frame that has to be focused on. Once I, once I receive students at the freshman level, it is very, very difficult to change those habits that are formed early on. 
Uh, and I'll go on at length about this, but it's a, it's a big passion. I'm uh, Eric Grant. I'm a product of North Carolina Public School System. Uh, so I'm a local guy here in Anderson City. I went to the U.S. of China for 26 years off doing social work in the low levels and decided to go to the PA. I went back to the A school and really wanted to go to Wake Forest to Wake Forest and I jumped into this thing called Problem Based Learning, which was the centerpiece of the first year of the at Wake Forest. And I honestly barely remember the first three months of education because it was so dramatic and different. I joined faculty after that, realizing the benefits of using problems in the system, saw how it transforms the thinkers, transforms the way people think about problems, and takes a challenge and becomes more to you. Potential failure becomes a chance to do something new. That type of different points, not outcome based, but creativity based, that's really what we need in the future providers, especially in the field where essentially the medical providers are going to ask people to do something. Increasingly shrinking budgets every day for after that. So our students are coming in, my job is a pre clinical director and back and forth just to help shape their thinking processes around medical problems that are not easy to solve, sometimes not solvable. What we notice most of the time is no action on so that's usually not what they're ready for. They want to get to the answer in about seven seconds in the minute search. We have to slow them down, make them think, we have to show them how. Solving the problem is different than how complex the problem is, especially when they come as a human condition. So it's something that we have to spend a lot of energy with the digital police students in. The feedback we get from our students, the receptive students, the receptive students, the receptive students, the receptive students, the higher students, they're going to be very positive about the difference that makes the students in the area of education. But that's a lot of work that we can put into the earlier structure of the education system. Hi, I'm Ian Rubichard. Uh, thanks for having us today. I, I grew up in rural South Carolina. My two grandfathers were public school superintendents, so we had lots of both military friends. We had lots of order in our family. <laughs> I married a wonderful kindergarten teacher, and so we continue to all sit in our color spaces and do exactly as the most exciting describes. It's a wonderful life. Uh, I'm the, a professor here in the medical school and a chair of the Department of PA Studies, uh, which is just next door. We're delighted to have you here with, with the rest of the residents. Um, over the past year, I've also um, I've been in our clinical enterprise and a fellowship and work in the workforce innovation, which is which was an activity to really think about the shift in clinical and care delivery from a fee-for-service model into more value-based delivery and, and uh, risk and population health delivery. So we've been really thinking about how we draw from individuals' uh, talents and how we shift our thinking and our problem solving in our workforce. And also to think about um, how we invent new professions and new jobs to address some of the issues that our current workforce just isn't prepared to deal with. But it's going to be a necessary part of having successful integration to a value-based care model. I've just stepped into a new role. Um, we, we were successfully able to, to uh, garner some funds from the National Institutes of Health. Um, and so a new role I'm in is leading a program around a, a translational workforce. And so that may, may be some of what I'm learning from colleagues here to translate as well. But this is really about trying to view our employer base and our workforce as a learning, as a part of a learning system. And as the problems become more complex, ambiguity is increasingly a part of our daily experience. Um, the, Clarity of decisions is no longer present. We have to tackle problems in collaborative fashions and in ways that allow us to leverage our uh, our, our talents uh, and our analytical skills. And so we're working very closely to try to evolve our workforce. We will have new jobs that have yet to be defined as we in clinical care delivery. And um, I guess another real passion about having grown up in a very small rural part of South Carolina is we are plagued by maldistribution of our healthcare providers in this state and in my home state, South Carolina. So we've been working hard in the medical school to work on local solutions to draw in, increase the capacity of these communities to train students who have strong backgrounds in science and math. Um, and then also to uh, leverage their homegrown cultural competency to 
and train them and prepare them to continue to deliver those services in their, in their communities. And I think this is an important part of what we have to think about, not just here in a beautiful um, uh, facility like the Parks Baptist, but also about how we partner in the community and help build that capacity since we are becoming one, um, one very great community. Thank you all. One, one of the things that struck me in our uh, seeing the, the learning that was going on, uh, listening to the teachers, listening to some of the, the, the leaders that have been helped with the training, and Novak, I think you alluded to this, is that, that in both the K-12 environment and in the post-secondary environment, uh, project-based learning are really driving students to, driving to problem solve. But that entails also a certain level of, of content, um, content knowledge that, that, that's required. And I know from being in the classroom and from, from the experience of, of our faculty of, of having enough content to, to be an effective um, problem solver in a realistic environment. Uh, it seems to be one of the challenges is, is how, do you get, how do you get that balance? And, and how do you get enough? How do you get enough content knowledge when certainly uh, technology and, and science is, scientific knowledge is expanding beyond what any of us can, can handle? How can, we, how can we reach that balance? Uh, content knowledge that's needed for problem solving. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll invite you to maybe begin a discussion, but others that would like to contribute to that. Thank you. Uh, I think there's generational uh, patterns in education. And I think what I see now are students that are coming into, uh, uh, into uh, the university where they have, we've allowed uh, technology to leapfrog uh, our ability to teach. So it was very techno technologically driven. And the, the product that we have now are students that uh, are in the Google world of answering questions. So pose a question and their immediate reaction is not to think about the problem, is to how fast can I get on my smartphone to Google the answer? And, and so absent from this whole process is, is their ability to think through uh, not even complex problems, but sometimes very simple problems. You can challenge them um, in ways that would surprise you. Uh, an algebra problem, for example. If um, uh, these, and again, I'm talking about very bright students that, 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 that we deal with, students that come in, we, I'm not plugging our university, but uh, the University of Texas at Dallas, we had the highest uh, average SAT scores of any of our campuses, including the flagship in Austin. Uh, and we marketed ourselves as a technology school, a STEM school. Uh, and so we get very, very bright students. But they've, they've been brought up in this generation that uh, has been very reliant on technology. And when you start this, it looks pretty good. But now we're at a point that we start to see, I believe, the downside. Um, and problem uh, and project-based learning is a way. And, and I truly believe this, of, of filling in that, that, that critical gap in the way people, the way the students are going to approach problems in the future. We have um, uh, the great examples here. I've never seen a more lively uh, uh, eighth grade classroom. I mean, my classroom was so different from the experience that, 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 that we shared today. Uh, uh, day and night difference, and and so 
But if you talk to the students, you find that they are really thinking about these problems. All right? But at the same time, they're learning mathematics. But it's critical thinking skills. And they're learning about scaling and, and all of this. And if, if you have the opportunity to, uh, to visit the uh, eighth grade one, where they were looking at the plots of, of, of land, and, uh, and uh, you will also see there was a, a poster that so showed the calendar uh, sequential days in there. But right next to that was an example of the state efficiency test. I don't, I don't remember what you call it in, in North Carolina. Uh, and, uh, but you could map the activities that were, that were taking place in that classroom directly to the uh, materials that are on the proficiency examination. I think this is a, an opportunity to, to fill a gap that we've been missing for a decade or more. It is one way to, to enhance our, our program. Let's, let's let our, our colleagues speak. I spoke to you. Let's ask a question. That is a hard question. <laughs> because uh, I think that students in a given program at a level have a fixed amount of energy and time that they dedicate to learn. So there's only so much energy that they have as it's uh, and So we have to get the biggest bang for the buck. Whatever you're trying to do, if it's memorizing something or a list of things, or if it's solving these types of problems or increasing complexity, I think the learning has to be very intentional to what you're trying to do. You've got to have the right kind of instructor educational specialist there to say to the instructor to the student, what are you trying to accomplish in these six hours or these two hours or three things? And then in this problem solving, you may have to sacrifice a little bit of content. You may have to say you can't learn all of this, you can't learn all 75 things, you can learn 60 things, because the other 15 are really kind of easy you can learn those on your own. You don't need to tell you that. We're going to focus on these things uh, while we're in this uh, setting of instruction setting. The PA program essentially makes those decisions intentionally about need the students to be able to discern this, 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 and this. They're quiet enough that you can tell them they can go over and listen to their studies. If we come back and just a proficiency in one way, we don't have to take up class time doing that. There's other ways to measure their effort and to make sure the time of the instructor and the person who uh, expertise showing the model is maximized. So that's something that if we have one year in the ACE week before they go out and come so we have a little less than 12 months, then you're ready to go out and uh, act as a student who can send and talk to patients, special patients, and evaluate patients. And so it's like this, as you can imagine. Um, so we're in special pressure. That's, that's a critical question. Uh, I, I joined the faculty here in 2010, and have come from a state uh, institution in South Carolina. We had a very traditional model of preparing for regional and program specific accreditation. And so we were had a couple years here before our, uh, we were due for accreditation in the eight program. And I remember the, the day that the accreditors visited on site. It was in, uh, it was in the summer, it was about 100 degrees, and the air conditioning generator broke on the building. Um, and um, it felt like it was 200 degrees in the day. Not, not this big of a And so we were already kind of worked up and sweating in the, the, natural, the natural anxiety and accreditation. And one of the questions that the site visitors asked early on was I think they were looking for some way to, to, to execute their checklist and so that we had this sort of sequence list of check. And they couldn't understand how you could take basic sciences and application of uh, clinical sciences and uh, physical exam maneuvers and behavioral science dimensions and integrate those in some way and sort of fold them together. So they were looking for these discrete pulled out components of content. And they, the creditor asked, I think what in retrospect he would have thought was a pretty stupid question, which was kind of this. And the fact that they almost, you know, sort of lovingly, after a few flesh of hearts, almost assaulted him intellectually. And they jumped on this piece. And the, and the passion really was that with some fundamental knowledge that, that folks can acquire, is within that space of having students learn to create a learning environment, their own learning environment, and then to facilitate not only their own learning, but the learning of others, um, and to realize that the talent and the intellectual pool or the prerequisite knowledge of a group, in our case of eight students around the table, 
is infinitely higher than the, than the prerequisite knowledge of any individual student. And so as they build that learning collaborative community, the powerful um, projection that that creates in that space. And so as, as they leave uh, that learning environment, they have learned increasingly more than we could possibly have delivered by stacking them in a lecture hall and trying to just uh, sort of deliver. And so it is, it is sort of mysterious to me still, even though I've had a good five years of observing the higher inquiry based learning model and, and others that, that folks use here, but it is an incredibly powerful tool to build the kinds of learning abilities and skills that are lifelong. Because I will tell you, if you walk in to see me if I'm caring for you as a patient, I absolutely did not know everything that I need to know to provide you on class scale. And that's terrible to say, but we've lost the ability to harness this much by medical knowledge. But I've been taught to be able to harness that and to collaborate with others so that I can solve those problems and help you develop a plan that optimizes your health. And that's really, I think, in the clinical workforce where we're, where we're, where we're moving. If I could add something uh, that is uh, really near and dear to my heart, is that when I was growing up, uh, and even the generation preceding that, really the, the, the post World War II generation, betting from the betting from the from the, uh, from the GI Bill, it's that it's that the jobs in in science and engineering, and mathematics were a way for the, uh, the uh, working class to elevate themselves to a, to, a, to a middle class standard. And where I see a great failure in, in, in many areas is that we're not directing resources to the populations that really uh, would benefit from, from those resources. I don't want to get into it political debate about how money is delivered, but I think that that's an extraordinarily important point because it provides a step up to a much greater uh, uh, capacity to earn uh, uh, in, in, in a fruitful way. It's a long question. Joe and I have a question. I'm just joking. Phil and I were on the Bell Links last week, and they wanted something different. They said, uh, we want you to observe the teacher's rules and the teacher's And then they looked at Joe and they said, we want you to demonstrate the lesson. I don't know if they think they, they Joe would teach or what it was, but here's Joe. Go to the fifth back. And he's working with the teacher. We're doing a problem. I thought it went well. I was in there. Everybody thought about the well until we went through the deep break. And one of the, the instructional coaches said, I didn't see any math today. And uh, we don't have time to waste on this. And it's like people give it as an idol or I don't want to be an inquiry or we're going to be learning stuff. And that's not the way it is. It's almost like if you can envision a screenshot where you're going back, but it looks like you're going in the opposite direction. But you're just increasing your potential energy. So think about it. We teach facts, and maybe they'll get it, and maybe they won't. But the point is, for what? You learned it in order to do what? When you get the context, and you have a need to know, then now the teacher is responding to the student's request for information, not the other way. Uh, I was sent out by my boss in the 80s for film teaching with a guy named John Shore from media. And about halfway through the morning, John turned to me and he said, this is like watching paint dry. And I said, I know. But what I saw today wasn't that. I saw kids in games. I, I saw teachers facilitating, and as Joe would say, teaching and facilitating. So I think that people who don't understand the methodology think it's an either or. Ever since we got into the testing and accountability unit, it has been forever. Uh, people are driven by performance, but sometimes the, the handles we're turning as hard as we can aren't connected to anything. They're not connected to performance. So we do really good at identifying the things we need to teach, but 
be not so good at figuring out the level of cognitive demand that we need to be posing to our children. So what happens is they get to a test, and if they get it the exact same way we taught it, they're fine. And if they see anything that's out of that norm, they come back to you and go, Dr. Green, you never taught that. Which means you didn't give us that exact scenario. So one of the one of the things that Joe and I do most is help dispel that myth that it's either this methodology or something else. Because if you're going to teach content, you can't do that content. And we have content workshops with the projects, but the, but the point is, why can't we do both? Why can't we connect them both in the same frame? Jeff finally said, how long do you spend on these concepts? And the coach said, we spend this much time. He said, it won't take any longer to get that done this way than it gets you to do yours. And I'm sitting there looking at their scores, and their highest proficiency is 40%. And it goes all the way down to 19. And the only group that's thriving are the HAG, which are the highly academically gifted. And I bet they didn't have more than what we've done up here in the table. And they were at 95%. So the question is, what are we going to do for the other children who aren't getting it? So uh, what I didn't say, what I wanted to say is, don't you think it's time to try a different plan? Something a little different than what we did. Good, thank you. Uh, I want to go back to something you said earlier, Dr. Bichard. Uh, Part of your responsibility is workforce innovation. And it, it strikes me as someone who's working in the community college round that you're the person I've been looking for. Because we, we've been trying to figure out where the workforce, where the workplace, where the skills of are going to go. Um, obviously, there's no specific definition to that. But as we think about the role of, of STEM, K-12, post-secondary, ultimately to the, the workplace, to careers. Um, what, what role, how, in your role in workforce innovation, um, how do you see the role of STEM education playing in, in the changing workforce, the changing jobs, even the changing jobs that, that may occur now in your healthcare but in the workplace? those changes in the jobs that you are moving to. What role do you see in STEM education and need for changes in STEM education occurring at that level? If I know it's the Well, I don't have all the answers, but I have maybe, maybe some thoughts I can try. Um, I think when, I think as I have spent the last year digging into our uh, our workforce a bit, working a lot collaboratively with nursing and medicine and other professions, we've done a lot of sort of appreciative inquiry, trying to understand what's going really well. We try to understand what is predicted uh, success as individuals are moved into areas that are new programs or in environments where there's enormous amount of dignity and certainty, and, and find out those individuals who just thrive in any scenario. And I think one of the things that we have discovered is the strength of their STEM education is, is, a, is an attribute. Uh, it's a predictor of their flexibility within a very dynamic changing workforce. That's one. Um, I think another is that uh, I'm not old enough to be cynical about this yet, although I'm working on it, uh, but I've started to say things like, well, back when I, which is, I think, an early sign, uh, the electronic health record has many great attributes, but it's kind of a pain that took us once in a while as well. And so as I, as I think about my, uh, sort of my own experience in that, um, even in my, my career, the amount of disruptive innovation that has occurred in healthcare and technology is just unbelievable. And so how do you have people that have a natural inclination to understand and embrace and even contribute to the utilization and optimization of design of those technologies and to, to care for patients in a caring way and not be put off course by the disruptive uh, impact of education? And I would say the same is true of our teachers. There are some teachers that can embrace and understand the role of uh, education technology, and there are some that just sort of deal with it because it's part of the job. But it's, it's something magical or something that happens uh, maybe as early as about fifth grade in, in just some anecdotal observations about how a child's mind is set and 
how they view the world and, and their, maybe their capacity for flexibility in a very dynamic force, at least in healthcare, we've noticed. And I think what we do leading up into those early years is more important to actually know we even realize. Um, we probably could invest earlier in this inquiry notion, um, strengthen those core skills, and many of the problems we're trying to figure out today, this, this generation would immediately understand the answer. Uh, we kind of don't know what we don't know. Uh, we're, we're spending a lot of time also um, trying to think about how those early years affect problem solving in complex environments. I'll give you one example, maybe others have a thought. Imagine being in a room with a patient or family where, uh, where a parent has a terminal illness or a child has a very serious developmental disorder um, and think about uh, the complexity of the illness, the complexity of the socioeconomic and the social uh, experiences in this room. And then think about how then a provider tries to create a learning environment in that space through the grief, through the confusion, through the fear, uh, and then have they been equipped to be able to master and coordinate their own learning in a way that they can now create it as a teacher. So the student becomes a teacher. And I think what we're seeing in the health workforce, particularly as we move into population health, is we can't afford to have providers that are also exceptional teachers as, as well as exceptional learners. And I think that early STEM education is more closely linked to that capacity for teaching and being able to shape learning environments where patients and families can be supported and empowered. And I'm not an expert, but I, I'm enough to know that. One of the things that, that characterized, I think, every session today was the passion of those young people for what they were doing. Governor asked this when he was here is how do we keep that, how, how do we encourage that, support that, nurture that, keep that alive through the education process? How do, how do, we, how do we take that, that passion that those sixth graders have, and those eighth graders have, and ensure that we have more of that where we saw those post secondary students, those community college students, they could have been university students. How do we build that? How do we keep that going? Um, I think that's, I think that's the key to take away. I, I don't know. We should be able to keep going. Thank you. I would first question and say, what is it we're doing to kill something? Because it's already present. Passion is there. And there's something about the way we can operate that takes that out, that has kids be afraid to make a school stand, afraid to take a bit, so we're disconnected with what we're working. So I think that their, their passion shows up naturally when we create an environment where they have an opportunity to connect and demonstrate. So I think the work we do is obvious. I don't think anything's happening for going away with children. But I do think that the further along they go, if we can't have them see something, some hope that their passion will go away. How we can continue right out here is a natural connector and historical connector to this community. And I remember when the place was built, the question was, are we going to make sure that the kids on the other side of the community have the same opportunities that this building as the kids over here? And so my question is, they have the ability. What can we do? as educators to make sure we have an opportunity. So I, I think the passion is natural, it's obvious, and I think we have the capability to nurture it and keep it from going away. Stan, I think you hit on something that is very important, and that's uh, any uh, systematic way that we, not intentionally, but begin to uh, apart somebody's self-confidence uh, and, 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 uh, and, and self-esteem. And, and we all go through harsh times in, in, in childhood and going into, in, into school is very difficult uh, for, for many students. And there's a lot of peer pressure associated with uh, their experiences. Uh, we need to develop a culture 
where the, the students have been not only, um, but uh, we build their, uh, their, their uh, self-esteem, their ability to uh, interact constructively with, with other individuals. They're very, very difficult challenges. Uh, and they're the hard ones. So these are very hard issues uh, uh, to deal with because there's always more simple answers. Let me turn quickly to a computer uh, to find out what somebody else thinks. And then that becomes what I think. Uh, there are characteristics of good learners. Uh, there's patience. There are persistence issues. Uh, we were talking earlier today about the fact that when confronted with a tough problem, a set of students working naturally, working through that, being trained to work through that, uh, they would rather throw up their hands and, and, and give up. We, uh, so there are characteristics that have to be built into our curriculum and our way of teaching that will allow self-esteem to flourish in the individual and to give them the, uh, the confidence to go on. I do a number of, uh, number, a small number of outreach programs. Uh, Dr. Khan is here and, and, and she has been uh, instrumental in, in bringing uh, uh, minority groups, uh, low economic uh, uh, sections of the society to the campus and introducing STEM uh, activities at the age of 12 or 14, something along that line. Uh, and you see remarkable transitions over the week or the week and a half that, that we have this, the students with us. Because they find out that they are capable, just like everybody else. Uh, and if you allow an environment to prosper where students feel it's okay that I don't know the answer, but I will find a way, because I've been taught this way by our educators, that I will proceed down a pathway that will be fruitful. And so, so well, I think the, we cannot lose the humanity associated with education these days. Uh, we have to be inclusive. It's extraordinarily important that we don't chase the women away. We don't chase the minorities away from the STEM fields. And oh, we're so good at chasing women away. Um, uh, and it's just horrible uh, to, uh, to look at an engineering program. I'm in the sciences. So I look at an engineering program, for example, and you don't see very few women. So inclusiveness is going to be very important in moving forward with this generation. I have no idea what the question was here. That was a good answer. This was a great answer. I'll just be brief because the comments before are so, so good. But I think about it. Um, organizing a curriculum, you know, it's potentially having a small protein shop and the same customers coming back every day for a year. And that's a student coming back to your classroom every day for several months. And so if you can't leave the same shoes and belts and ties on the shelves every single day and expect them to be, oh, look, it's the red tie again. And, you know, they're, they're hungry for creativity and diverse environments and challenges. But you can't go too far, or you certainly don't take care of ourselves too far when you're saying you need too far. So it must be very thoughtful, shifting, thoughtful movement within the educational space to keep them challenged and a little unsure, but they can still see the other side to some degree, but to keep them hungry for that next step. But you can't the same thing all the time. The, the short attention span and energy and the, the social culture we're growing up in does not support that. So we have to. Respect of these people are, and we want to set up to make sure that we 
environments and so makes sense for that. We've also seen studies that used to be our world of medicine that the empathy of the provider goes down the longer you're in training. Uh, so, for example, medicine, medical residents in the students who went to medical school four years, residents in three to six years, fellowship, they have a steep loss of empathy for their uh, the time they're out. PA school for two years, so we lose a little empathy or stay fairly level sometimes. Hopefully, we can raise it in some programs, but it's it's a natural thing that we see where the longer you're there in an environment that is not suited or that you're not fully happy to start to do something. Does anybody have a happy message? <laughs> we're, we're here in part this afternoon to talk about STEM. I pose another question to you. Uh, last week, uh, the University of North Carolina School of the Arts uh, inaugurated and saw the new, new Chancellor, Chancellor Lindsay Beerman. And Chancellor Beerman, in his installation of the remarks, said that, that there was something missing in STEM, and that was the aim. The arts, it creates steam. Steam is a creator of energy. Steam is, is a powerful force. Let me ask you how in, in, the, in the area of problem teaching, invigorating our educational process with problem solving skills, communication skills, um, the, uh, the kinds of critical thinking skills. Step away from STEM just a minute and say, what, what role do the arts play in education and development of this character? You got it. <laughs> um, a person that I admire greatly uh, has a, uh, a PhD in environmental engineering uh, and a, uh, a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a bachelor's degree in fine arts. And so this person carries with them this innate creativity that was first expressed in the arts and then carried on through uh, uh, into uh, the more uh, challenging uh, uh, STEM, STEM field. The, um, the arts have played a very important role in uh, inspiration, connecting what we do to arts is very important. I'll give uh, two examples. Uh, we have, uh, just this last year, this is one of the more difficult faculty searches I've ever uh, led, was to uh, bring in an arts conservation uh, uh, faculty member that will work in partnership with uh, Dallas Museum of the Arts. Uh, and, uh, we needed somebody that was going to fit into a chemistry department, do PhD level research, train the students so they can pass qualified exams and all that, and at the same time are going to have both an appreciation for the arts, identify problems associated with restoration, uh, uh, care, uh, you know, proactive care. That nature that's very important to, to our culture. Uh, and we identified somebody, and I believe that this will be a very productive position. I think that the students are intrinsically drawn to beauty, and beauty is expressed in the arts. And so that, that is one connection that I find is going to be, uh, it gives me great hope that we'll have a flourishing uh, uh, program associated with that. The, uh, the second uh, item I do want to mention, the importance of uh, arts uh, in the creative process. So we have um, in the School of Arts and Humanities at my university, they started a arts and technology program. And 
this was a degree program uh, that combined very specifically the arts and technology. And it became wildly successful. And I think just last year, we split it apart uh, from arts and humanities to be a standalone uh, a school. A school is at college uh, in, in our family. Uh, a standalone school with its own dean, uh, its own uh, faculty. These draw on uh, uh, engineers, they draw on computer scientists, they draw on the, uh, on the people that have the, the uh, intrinsic art characteristics. I don't have those characteristics, so I just look at these people, these role models. The, um, and, and so they move hand in hand to these various problems uh, these various new endeavors that they can take on. The most obvious, I think, is, is computer gaming and things of that nature, virtual learning, uh, three-dimensional visualization. These are topics that they work on. And this will have, uh, 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 this will provide them, I believe, a viable future. So it really is a very important marriage between arts and, and sciences, and one can easily feed off of the other uh, in, 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 a, in a variety of different ways. So, yeah. I can share a little bit about, about our program. I'm the son of a, a concert pianist, and my mother is the most creative sort of, uh, she just doesn't conform to any single structure, I would describe it, in the most beautiful way. My father's a scientist. Uh, they just found each other because there's nothing about them that's remotely similar <laughs> other than their love for each other, which is sort of lovely. But uh, I think so even from early childhood, uh, my personal perspective was that, that art uh, strengthens one's mathematical skills and, and science attitude. Um, and also art is a, is a beautiful way to connect with, uh, with others. It's a, it's, it's a way to experience subject rather than just gain knowledge. So in our PIM program, where we have 80% women, and our profession is 70% women now, I think it's one of the more accessible sort of science um, rich fields uh, that has such human uh, touch. I think what we found is that the power of the humanities is one of our, is one of our greatest secret weapons. Uh, here, I'm speak a little bit about it, but we have a, a lecture course called Sacred Seven where students paint and write poetry and uh, write music and participate in getting ready to be a part of a stage production of WIT coming up soon in the year. So they're highly engaged in the humanities uh, and, the, and the patient narrative as a way to understand and contextualize the circumstances in which our patients and families uh, live. We also uh, use art as a teaching tool, not just because they enjoy it, but because we find it very uh, useful. So I'll give you one example. Um, when you think about the dermatologic manifestations of disease, it's difficult with lots of different beautiful colors of skin and different ages um, to then describe with consistency how a lesion or a rash or an injury may appear and to do that in a way that somebody can then understand by reading that narrative and chart um, how that is. And so we have to build their vernacular to describe things with texture and color. And so we send them to one of the local museums in town, the Roller House, and they study paintings and gain their vernacular working with the art and historians so that they can then apply that language in the, in the description of patients. It's a short activity. It's very different from being in the lecture hall, but their ability to then be successful in the clinical bar is so much deeper, and they absolutely love it. Um, and it also sort of is a sort of point of sort of connection. So I would say that the arts are rich, at least in our medical school, and um, I, I think that the more that we can do to leverage it as a teaching tool, but also it's because the students want it, it's a point of connection. Powerful innovators. But the last thing I would say is that the single best predictor of success in our VA program is curious, this level of curiosity. Um, and so I think, think a little bit about what Stan says. If we can do things that incentivize and encourage and promote curiosity, curious child, there's really nothing they can't accomplish. And so I, I think that's really important. Is that one reason that the emotional experience highlights memory? So if you can have an emotional experience that's safe, controlled, and not dangerous for the person, 
but this emotionalized experience of learning, whether it's achievement or it's uh, even sadness to some degree of reflection, people remember those things in their lives more acutely. You remember your own emotional experiences, you probably still see the sunset on that day, whatever it was. And so the students can do the same thing. We can leverage that same tool that they actually have built inside of them to help them with memory and retention and uh, process. Okay, Pat, we've got a few more minutes. We've got a real opportunity here. Uh, and that is we have an audience of our State Board of Education, uh, our policy makers for education in the state of North Carolina. I'd like to invite each of you to suggest something policy level that could enhance and enrich the kind of education we've been talking about today that, that, that might be might be a value to our uh, What I would do is uh, twist that just a little bit. I, I think that I have to do a great job of policy. And, uh, I think that quite often schools and school districts don't. So my question would be to the district, what policies that you, do you have in place to support this type of learning, uh, this type of expansion of children? What policies are in place that are prohibiting this? And I think what happens in schools is we have practices. And the practice could be good, but the person leaves. And then the practice leaves. So I would, I would suggest that we help schools and districts establish the same local policies that you guys are on. So that there's a consistency all the way down. That's my thought. I think I've already mentioned uh, a policy uh, point, and that is the, the distribution of funds to uh, various school districts. We see it in Dallas, in Dallas ISD. It's one experience. If you go up to Plano, four miles away, it's a very different experience that you have. And that's economically extraordinarily important if we are going to enable our, uh, our uh, low income minority uh, population. This is time to sky kind of stuff, but this is just anything. <laughs> so uh, I think it'd be wonderful, wonderful for you to humanize the center as distant process a little bit more. We've got more of a hands on human observation of some of the issue that becomes part of the uh, measurement process. Uh, Simply what we all using in our level of choice testing is the easiest uh, non judgmental way to test it. Uh, but if we could humanize it a little bit more on the way to next bring humanity back into the STEM process and the control process, because by the time students get to our level, they're so used to not being watched, and uh, they're so used to passing tests and saying, that's good enough, right? Uh, and we sort of, I don't know how you do it. I could pretend to have any challenges that we can all want to work on, but that's all. I think my comment is similar to uh, Professor Grass. I, I think um, I was thinking also about assessment, having a wife as a kindergarten teacher and um, early childhood, um, the anxiety for her and her students and families around those benchmarks, which is important for all students to teach the camera, but it was, a, it was a level of anxiety that I observed that maybe seemed unproductive at times. And I don't know if this was just my experience, but it seems like school taught me my character. Got some from church, got some from family, but it was really the time that I spent with teachers in public schools that, that really probably shaped a good part of my character. If there is a way for us to assess children, their ability to be collaborative, to be mindful, and to be um, supportive of others, and to integrate that kind of humanistic assessment as non cognitive attributes, as we also assess the cognitive, I think what we'll do is not only improve confidence in our ability to support them. Um, to, to change our approaches to teaching them in a way that they'll be more successful, but also to do things like encourage, uh, encourage citizenship, leadership, and to foster a generation of future teachers. So I would again add the, the elements of non cognitive assessment into our routines. Now we've spent the afternoon today in the innovation or and I, I am confident that, that, that with 
have seen and experienced real innovation. And when we started off at, at lunch, uh, Dr. Collinson uh, talked about uh, the innovation, as it's, it's, it's viewed in the innovation quarter here, is it's translating an idea, a discovery, an asset, into good or services that has value for which people will acquire or use to benefit. Without innovation, without innovation in the educational system, that passion that those young people show, that expertise that those teachers show, the, the, without the, the level of knowledge that, that our community college students show, um, not far, not far out of high school uh, in terms of their education process, the kinds of innovation and the kinds of use of technology that show up in the post secondary level. And, and then talk, we talk some about that workforce innovation, career innovation that comes along with the kinds of learning that is required to do all this today. So I want to thank you and thank our panelists especially. Uh, for the really thoughtful, considered the remarks and comments that you've been able to contribute uh, to this conversation today. Thank you all very much.